in this lesson, we're going to be talking about, uh, this is the beginning of lesson four. And it's talking about uh, predicting weather and other things based on patterns. So the opening of this talks about has this woman and it's asking about uh, how might this forecaster predict future weather conditions and describe things that she might use and whether you think her prediction is likely to be accurate. So this is kind of a piece for you kind of to answer in your own words more. What, what do you think she's doing? But I said things like, it looks like there's a C and H, maybe for cold and hot. It looks like there's a cold front graphic over here. And it looks like she's predicting five days out. So I think she's using maybe the cold fronts, hot, um, hot fronts, a uh, warm fronts, um, to predict things and it looks like her prediction should probably be fairly accurate because it's only five days out. So that's what I said here. Um, exploration one, I mean you continue to go back to this throughout the rest of the lesson or we do. So exploration one talks about using models, more specifically mathematical models in science. So we have two different uh, graphics over here. And uh, the first question, uh, this, these are two different models. You know, this is a physical model over here, um, this one, right? That's a physical model. And then this one up here is kind of a diagram. This is actually a food web, and we talk about these a lot. But one misconception people have about food webs is you notice the direction that the arrows point. Food webs are measuring energy. So the reason that the grass points to the deer is because the energy from the grass goes to the deer when it's being when the deer eats the grass. Or when rabbits eat grass, the energy goes from the grass to the rabbit. Or if a rabbit is eaten by a hawk, you know, its energy goes to the hawk. So these are diagrams for energy. And two says, um, describe the food web up here using the words increase or decrease and it says that the rabbin population would decrease if the supply of grass became limited and why is it decrease instead of increase well if there's less grass the rabbits eat the grass right so if there's less grass then there's less food essentially so you wouldn't be able to support as many rabbits living there. So there would be a decrease of the rabbit population. Um, and then if the population of rabbits and mice decreased, right? So if the population of rabbits and mice decreased, what would happen to the hawks? Well, the hawks population would probably decrease as well because it looks like the hawks are eating the mice and the rabbits. And if there's no mice and rabbits or if there's uh, a lot less mice and rabbits, um, then the hawks don't have as much food. So these are both decrease. And then it said, write a question about this picture and the Nautilus. Now I actually know what a Nautilus is because I I just know what they are kind of as animals. Um, so the question I wrote, the, these uh, live in the ocean, right? You could look up a picture if you don't know what they are. Um, that's not like cut in half, obviously. And I said, what part of the body does the nautilus use to move around through the water? Um, and because I know that a nautilus shoots water out, like a jet stream of water to propel itself. And it actually uh, goes in this direction, like the nautilus moves forward in that direction. Um, and its eyeballs are like over here and it's looking that, that this way. Um, but it looks like I, you could use this to answer that this right here looks like uh, where the nautilus, the part of the body that the nautilus is using, because it looks like a, the opening of like a, a jet engine or something down here, right? A rocket engine where it could fill this with water and then maybe squeeze it or something and it would shoot the water out in this direction and then the nautilus would go that direction. So I think that's uh, what it uses. And this one I talk about maybe using it to answer how water moves throughout the uh, the mountains because it looks like these might be roads or water, but um, maybe knowing the what the color 
it, it talks about how the healthy vegetation is is red um, so you know what is what are all these lines things or so how do things travel throughout mountains particularly water could be a question that you might be able to use this to help answer something like that the big takeaway for today and this lesson is about mathematical models so these are certain kinds of models up here but this lesson is mostly about uh, and weather in particular uses lots of mathematical models to make their predictions right um, an example of a mathematical model could be like a really simplified up here if there is half as much grass then there will be you know let's say there's half as much grass that's half the food so maybe half of the rabbits die off um, or maybe a fourth of them die off something like that trying to figure that out that would be a mathematical model that you could use um, now down here it has a an example of a mathematical model and I actually plotted these out ahead of time just to save a little bit of time so first it says plot the data from the tables on the graph so we have the runtime right which is right here and then the weeks so week one right week one is 11.95 so it's almost 12 so you go from one you could go up and I made this dot right here almost to 12 and you just repeated that right and it looks like it's kind of maybe starting here but then it's dropping down a little bit so then we go down here and lo and behold here it is plotted out for us already and um, it says Dwayne's goal this is the same chart from above his goal is to run one mile in eight minutes or less so he, we drew a it says he drew a trend line a trend line is because these dots aren't really fall aren't really lining up perfectly but it's kind of like you can draw a line how they are what the dots seem to be going like they went up but you know like it's you're just drawing it kind of how they went if the dots were going all up like this you know you could draw a trend line maybe going up like that that's what a trend line is so uh, we can use this trend line to help predict whether or not he would actually uh, run that fast so according to the trend line it would take until I said it would take until eight week eight because it says will he reach his goal by week seven or week eight well if I look up from seven if I follow up from seven right to where the trend line is it's right here this is where seven meets the trend line so it seems like if he's following his trend of running that lines up with just about eight and three-fourths but still closer to nine minutes um, but then if you get to week eight right week eight is right here and that lines up perfectly if you go across with this purple line perfectly with eight minutes so it seems like he would make it in eight weeks and then it says did you know that this line represents an equation so this equation right here is our mathematical model right this equation you could use to figure out all of these numbers and it's telling us that the y would equal the runtime in minutes and the x equals the runtime in uh, in the time in weeks so here it says the let me erase this so oh, I can erase this oh yeah okay, there we go. so what it does is it says we're trying to figure out week seven right and up here it says that X is the time in weeks the X is the time in weeks so we replaced the X with seven and we multiply it. you can solve this equation simplifying all of this will get us 8.3 so you can say in seven weeks, nope, it's still higher than eight minutes. And then it says figure it out for week seven, or sorry, for eight weeks. So um, what I did was I took eight, because it's the eighth week, and I put it in right here for x, right? This is the same exact equation. I'm just resolving it with eight instead of seven, right? These are the two parts that changed. So we haven't talked in math actually about how to multiply negatives and positives uh, really, but the if 
it, this becomes two thirds times eight is 16 over three and it's negative because um, it's a negative times positive. And then we have talked about how to add negatives and positives though. And so 16 thirds is five and a third. And so five and a third um, and 13, this is negative, right? So it'd be like, you have $13, but you got some debt. So then how much do you really have? Well, you really have seven and two thirds. It's like you have to subtract this. So we can see that seven and two thirds, that's less than eight. So in eight weeks, right? If it was eight weeks then Y, which equals his runtime in minutes. So his runtime in minutes does actually equal less than eight. So it would match. What are the limitations of mathematical models? So the limitations, this is the big thing about mathematical models is this is really simplified, right? You could, this equation, right, is based off of this trend line. But, you know, what if he got injured? Let's say like one week he got injured. So all of a sudden he's running 13 minute miles again. Well, then the trend line is not going to go down like this. It's going to kind of start maybe at the same place, but then it's going to go up more because he ran farther. So it's going to kind of drag the whole line in an upward direction. And then our whole equation would be totally different because this equation is based off of this trend line. So there's a limitation with mathematical models and the limitation is that you can't represent things perfectly from nature with math necessarily um, in all cases. So you may, maybe you can get ridiculously close, but it can't be perfect. So uh, that's why, you know, weather predictions are really close oftentimes, but they're not exact because uh, weather is a complex thing. So here's a lab and you can do this lab if you choose to. It's totally optional if you want to have something to do at home. And then here we have some more examples of uh, crickets and using uh, equations to figure out the number of chirps that these crickets make. And it gives us this equation right here, T equals N plus 40, or the T, so the temperature equals the number of chirps every 13 seconds plus 40 degrees. So you could take um, the number of chirps, right? N is the number of chirps. So you could take the number of chirps that the crickets makes, adds 40, and supposedly that will give you an uh, estimate of the temperature. And so you can use that to solve this. And then down here, and, and 9 is the same thing, and it'll, but it modifies this formula. It says n equals t minus 40. So the chirps, now you can solve for chirps. The chirps equals the temperature minus 40. And so you take these three temperatures, right? And you take the temperature, right? This is for 5 p.m., 6 p.m., and 7 p.m. So like for 5 p.m., that was right here. I took the temperature 70, and I using this formula right here, I did 70 minus 40 to get 30. So you're predicting that the crickets would be chirping 30 times in 13 seconds based off of the temperature being 70 degrees. And going back up here, this would be the case for both things. It says, you know, the actual temperature measured at 4 p.m. because 7 was about around 4 p.m. The actual temperature was uh, not 79, right? It was 76.6. .6. So why was our estimate different? Um, so one thing is that, uh, like it mentions up here, right at the end of this page up here, 336, um, it, a mathematical model has limitations because it's a, it's a simplification of the real world. So it's not going to be exact. Another thing is maybe you're not actually looking at the crickets. Maybe you're just listening. So there could be limitations to your test. Like maybe you're actually hearing a multiple crickets and you're putting them together or something like that. You know, this model might not include, it says note any other limitations this model have. Um, the model might only be accounting for a particular species of crickets. Maybe it only works at a certain time of the year. And so if you do it during a different time of the year or with a different type of um, cricket, the equation would be totally different. So 
this moves on to exploration two. But this question right here is kind of the big takeaway for the whole lesson. The whole big takeaway for exploration one is oftentimes in science, you know, especially in weather, you're using mathematical models to model interactions in the natural world. And that works great because you can test them and you can make them better over time, but they always have limitations and they're never perfect because it's not the real world. So you always have to consider um, that when you're using mathematical models, that they are might be close, but they're not going to be exact. That's it.